Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. So, if I sound a little bit under the weather, it's because I've been battling a cold for the past week, and I'm feeling a bit better now than I initially was, but still don't feel quite 100%, and I haven't, I don't have the energy or the desire to dig into the uh, cleanup and engine bay prep on this thing right now, but, <laughs> I still want to keep I still want to keep the train rolling forward. So we're going to do a couple of smaller projects on the Mark IV Supra in this episode. So if you see right here, I have one of the rear Aluma stars off of the car disassembled without the slick that was on it, the beadlock ring over there, and I have a drag radial right here. So we're going to start this video by mounting the new radial or the outstanding new radial onto the wheel and getting it ready to go into service on the car. So let me grab a flashlight real quick. But I already mounted one yesterday as kind of a proof of concept to make sure that everything would work fine. And all is well with the driver's side one. So the only part that was a little bit different or a little bit difficult to contend with is this right here so i needed to swap out the valve stem as the slicks that were on the car had tubes in them the tubes have their own valve stem that's attached to them you don't run tubes with radials and i needed to put just a valve stem in place however the way that this beadlock conversion is designed i needed to take and notch the inside beadlock ring that was actually welded to the wheel to give clearance for the valve stem and to allow me to actually get an air chuck in place to fill the tire up. So we need to do the same thing with the other wheel. I just wanted to do this one first to make sure that the idea was a feasible one and it turned out to work out. So without further ado, let's go over and get started modifying that wheel and then we can go through the beadlock assembly process as if you guys have never worked with them before. It's kind of an interesting concept and it's a much easier way to mount tires in my opinion as opposed to the old fashioned way and also more effective. So the issue that we're dealing with here is the straight valve stem hitting onto this beadlock ring here. So hopefully this camera angle will illustrate it properly for you guys. So the way that this valve stem is constructed, you have obviously the valve itself, the tire valve. You have this little rubber gasket that goes into the hole in the wheel and kind of helps to center it and guide the valve stem as it comes through. We have a little washer and a nut. And these two get tightened down onto the valve stem and with the other rubber gasket underneath of this washer, it pinches everything together and causes everything to seal up. So, the issue that I'm having is I can't run this valve stem straight through, and I'm not sure if you guys can see it from this angle, but the tire valve, the valve stem, is not sitting centered in the hole. So what needs to happen is need to come in and take a notch out of this beadlock ring here, just to provide clearance for the valve stem and then for the actual tire chuck, the tire inflation tool, to be able to go onto the end of the tire valve, depress the Schrader valve inside of it, and actually fill the tire up with air. So, as you guys saw with the other wheel, I was able to get that one knocked out. And on this one, I just need to come in, take the same, there is a similar notch out of it, test fitting the tire chuck to make sure that I have clearance to it, uh, on this beadlock ring and in a very short amount of time everything should be good and I can tighten this down and we can move on to actually mounting the tire on the wheel.
a little bit of grinding and a few coats of paint and the wheel now accepts our new valve stem. So if you can see right here, it didn't take that crazy of a notch to accommodate the space or to achieve the space needed to accommodate our air chuck. And we have plenty of clearance all around, both right now with the bare wheel and then with the beadlock ring on. So this wheel is squared away on this front and we can move on now to actually getting the tire mounted onto the wheel. The wheel is now slid inside of the tire, and one little note I wanted to make, see if I can do this one-handed. Eh, no, I can't. So, we'll just look at the beadlock ring, because it's the same on the wheel side. If you notice, on the inside of the ring, it's knurled the whole way around. And on the welded-on ring on the wheel itself, it also has knurling on it. So the purpose of this, is to allow the both sides of the ring or both sides of the beadlock assembly to really bite down on the bead of the tire and prevent the wheel from rotating inside of it. So that is the premise of a beadlock in the first place, is to lock the bead to the wheel. So in an off-road application with an immense amount of side load on a tire, you can de-seat or de-bead the tire that way and not a good time. In a different application, in the drag racing arena, what we're trying to do is to prevent the wheel itself from rotating inside of the tire without the causing the tire to actually bite and move. Now a car such as Supra here, or any other drag car, they can launch so hard that you actually break the not the seal, but you break the bond between the tire and the wheel, and the wheel itself will rotate while the tire does not, and that equates to just wasted energy, and I suppose if you did it for long enough, you could have a destroyed tire as well. So what we do is form a mechanical clamp between the outer beadlock ring, the inner beadlock ring, and the bead in between the two of those, disallowing the wheel to rotate free of the tire. So hopefully that makes sense. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with beadlocks, but for those of you who are not, hopefully that little anatomy lesson uh, was a benefit to you. So the next thing that we have to do is start assembling all of this. And it is not that difficult to do, but there are some considerations that we have to take into account as we are doing this. So I'm going to go ahead and take my old beadlock bolts and take off the permanent marker mark that is on all of them so I can start fresh. And then we'll start talking about how we actually assemble them and what needs to be done to put wheels like this together. All right, now it's time to put the wheel together, at least the beadlock side. So I have the beadlock ring. I will place it roughly in the position that it will be sitting at. And actually the one thing you want to do first before you even consider putting the beadlock ring on is to make sure the tire is centered on the wheel. Otherwise you could pinch the tire in an odd way. It won't be seated correctly on the wheel and then you'll either damage the beadlock ring, damage the wheel, or best case scenario have to redo the work you were just doing. So I have the instructions from OMF, which they are the manufacturer of the beadlock conversion that was done to this wheel. And I'm fairly current on these instructions as I just did the other wheel in uh, very recently, but I'll have it here just for reference as far as the torque specs and everything else as there's so many torque specs for so many different things over the years that it can be a little bit difficult to remember all of them. So. The first thing we're going to do is to take some anti-seize and we are going to put anti-seize on all of the beadlock bolts so that will prevent any galling or anything like that as we're tightening this down. So we don't want to mess the threads up on 
any of these holes is that would cause some pretty big issues that would need to be remedied before we can go any, any further with this. So I'll put a little bit of anti-seize on each one of the bolts, drop it in the hole, hand tighten it, or hand start the threads rather, move on to the next one, so on and so forth. And I believe we'll be doing that 24 times if I remember what I counted yesterday correctly. So the one thing with these bead locks is they look awesome and obviously they function well, but they are a lot of work to put together as opposed to a normal wheel and tire setup. But a normal wheel and tire setup, like we just said a little while ago, is apt to spinning the wheel inside of the tire on a car like this, whereas a beadlock prohibits that from happening. So. Let's go ahead and get all of the bolts anti-seized and put in their homes and then we can move on to the next step. Alright, that is the final bolt anti-seize put in place, all of that. So, we're now ready to start the tightening process and we are done with the anti-seize. So, let me go ahead and close my anti-seize, take my gloves off, as nothing else with this will be dirty like the anti-seize was. And what I'll do now, I'm just going to take my marker and mark out bolts that are directly opposite from each other. And the reason that I like to do this as I'm tightening this down, I'm going to be going in a star pattern or a cross pattern similar, similar to what you would do tightening a wheel down. Now if I just mark one fastener, then I have to keep an, a count that at least for me is difficult to do as I'm tightening all this down. As opposed to if I have two bolts, I know I start here and here move one over, two over, so on and so forth. And if I lose track, then I can pick whichever reference bolt that I was working off of and go, all right, I know that I am four bolts over here, which means I should be four bolts over based off of the other reference bolt, if that makes sense. For my mind, it's just an easier way to keep track of where I'm at. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Now to start this, I'm going to use this speed wrench here and just gently get everything seated. So we'll start on our two reference bolts and I'm going to work in a clockwise rotation going around here. Oops. And we'll just keep working around until we have all of these at least snugged up and then we'll move on to the torque wrench. All right, we are done with the speed wrench now, and I'm going to move on to the torque wrench. So this is a two-part torque sequence, and referencing our instructions here, the first portion of the sequence for 13 through 20 inch bead locks, we tighten all the bolts to 10 to 12 pound feet of torque. So I'm going to go on the high side of that as I like torquing things more tightly than more loosely. So we have five, 10, and 12. So I'll snug up my torque wrench and slowly start working around. So if we listen closely, you hear that click? It means we are at 12 pound feet there. Go over to the other, the opposing side. Click there, and I'll just keep working in the same star pattern that I was working with 
that I was, uh, yeah, that I was working with with the speed wrench. Work our way around, get everything tightened down. Once I have achieved my 12 pound feet on all of the bolts, I'll go around and go rather than the star pattern, just in a normal clockwise circular pattern. Double check the torque on everything, make sure that we're still good to go. And from there we can move on to the second phase of the torquing sequence. All right, so we're done with the first sequence, or the first torque sequence. And now the second one, we are going to 20 to 22 pound feet of torque. So go ahead and we'll loosen the bottom set nut on, or the set fastener on the torque wrench. We'll go up to 20, 21 and 22. Looks good. Tighten this down on the bottom. And this is where things get a little bit interesting. So I'm going to straddle this as this feels sketchy tightening these down. You kind of feel like you're going to strip something out, but we don't. And that's where the anti-seize is very important. So again, working in a nice, cross bolt pattern, tighten all these down, walk back around clockwise, the same as we just did. And that's the unfortunate thing about these is it gets quite repetitive to knock out the torquing sequence of these wheels, but it's a necessary evil if you want to run beadbox. And back in real time for the final click. Beautiful noise. Now the beadlock ring is all tightened. So always make sure that you loosen your torque wrench out so it isn't sitting there at a specific torque for a long period of time. So that's done. You can set the tool aside and then check along the inside of the wheel, or the inside of the beadlock rings and According to OMF's sheet, we should, the two halves of the beadlock ring, or the beadlock assembly, should be pinched together without a gap in between them, which is exactly what we have here. If that is not the case, at the bottom of this sheet, they talk about beadlock shims, if you guys can see that right there. But in this instance, we don't need the shims. The torque that they suggested was the proper amount to apply to this. And now we are ready, or almost ready, to put air in this and fill it up. And we are on to the last step before it's actually time to put air in the tire. So, since the tire, or the wheel and tire, rather, were screwed together before, as evidenced by all the holes going around the back side of the wheel, I did a Google search to see what people are doing for drag radials as opposed to slicks. And the consensus that I saw was that you don't run screws on radials, but rather you can use this super high tech gasket sealant for the bonding agent between the, on, in this case, the inner bead of the tire and the inner bead of the wheel. So the fact that it has a single beadlock on it, this really probably isn't necessary, but it's one of those things where it probably can't really hurt anything to do so. So that's what I did on the other wheel and we're going to do the same here. So maybe don't exactly quote me on this as I'm not a drag wheel and tire expert, but it made sense, what, or what I read made sense. So that's what we're going to do. So this stuff, at least the instructions on the tube say you put one coating of super high tack on whatever surface you're working with, wait for it to tack up, and when, the, when it has reached the point where it has tacked up, 
you put a second layer on and immediately seat the surfaces together. So what we're going to do is put one layer on, allow it to tack, put a second layer on, and then immediately go over and seat the tire. So what we'll do as a preemptive measure for seating the tire is come in here, grab my little Schrader valve tool, and if you guys like my nice Michael Jackson glove, that'll be for putting this super high tack on. But we'll go ahead and remove the Schrader valve just so that way we're not trying to do that while we're in the, uh, the period of time where this gasket sealant is going to be setting up. It'll already be ready to go over there and seat the tire on the inside bead. So let's go ahead, put this sealant on, and then we can go over, seat the tire, and all will be well aside from a balance that will be necessary for both of these rear wheels before this car actually goes back on the road. And there we have it. This is the passenger side, or the passenger rear wheel. Tire is now all mounted, all filled up with air, and everything is seated. The back bead popped on there nicely, and like I said a few moments ago, minus being balanced, these rear wheels are ready to roll down the road. So hopefully if any of you guys were at all interested in how bead locks go together. Now you have a little bit better understanding of their anatomy and what it takes to mount one up. I actually prefer bead locks over a normal traditional uh, wheel mounting method or tire mounting method rather. And the only difficult part, it, depending on the tire that you're using, is the dismounting process. So the bead lock ring comes off and this outside face of the tire is no big deal to get unseated, but the inside can be a little bit cumbersome. Now, when I was pulling the, uh, the bias ply slicks off, a buddy of mine and I, we were trying everything we could possibly imagine. And I'll put a, a uh, photo in right here of how we were trying to dismount one of the slicks here at the shop. And we tried everything from working with uh, this Harbor Freight bead breaker that I had. And I'm sure you guys can see right here that it died a valiant death and didn't get the job done for both of them. But trying to use the lift arm with a piece of wood with things ratchet strapped in place and trying to rig everything as best we could. Neither one of us are the type of people that quit on things. But we uh, reached the point of diminishing returns and realized that we needed to call in reinforcements in the form of a tire machine to actually get it dismounted. So took care of that and now have radials for the rear of this thing. And uh, I'm excited to try radials out. It's been a while since I've used them. And I can't recall actually having drag raced on them. So this will be a whole new experience for me. And since the car is an automatic now, and I don't have to worry about the wheel hop issues that are associated with drag radials on an independent rear suspension stick car, we can actually make use of radials and uh, their beneficial characteristics on this car now. So that wraps up what I wanted to do here today. And in the not too distant future, we're going to go ahead and move on to the fuel tank on the Mark IV, as there are a couple of modifications I would like to do to it to make it a little bit more along the lines of what I actually want in terms of the tank on this thing. So 
we will cross that bridge when we come to it very soon. And I guess until then, I'll see you guys then, and we'll keep moving forward, knocking out a few projects for the old Mark IV here.